Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight on such a beautiful night. Uh, Bonnie and I were just remarking this is one of the biggest crowds we've had, which is appropriate. Thank you, Marla, for bringing everyone out tonight. <laughs> Marla Daly is the past president of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation and has been studying and writing about the cultural histories of all eight of the California Channel Islands for more than 40 years. You must have started when you were six. <laughs> Her California Channel Islands Encyclopedia, Islopedia, am I pronouncing that correctly? Islopedia, is now online and contains over 11,500 pages of information about these fascinating offshore lands. Marla is a graduate of the University of California at Santa Barbara, where she received a degree in cultural anthropology. And she's worked on the Channel Islands since 1973, when she spent a summer conducting archeological survey on Santa Cruz Island. Marla continued her island work as assistant to the University of California's Santa Cruz Island Reserve Manager and later with Kerry Stanton, owner of Santa Cruz Island and the Santa Cruz Island Company. In 1985, Stanton formed the Santa Cruz Island Foundation, also known as SCIF, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the cultural histories of all eight of the Channel Islands. Daly served initially as vice president and later as president of SCIF, a position she held until her retirement. Marla is an accomplished author who, along with Skiff, has published more than a dozen books and articles about the California Channel Islands. In 1994, the California Historical Society bestowed upon Marla their Distinguished Service Award for her leadership, service, and dedicated efforts to preserve and promote the history of the Channel Islands. Tonight, we're fortunate to have Marla share images and stories from her newest book, Images of America, Anacapa Island. Please help me welcome Marla and sit back and enjoy the special stories about this island. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura, for that warm welcome and Bonnie. I have a few things before I start the show. The first is Laura mentioned Islapedia. You've all heard of Wikipedia when you're Google searching anything. Anything you want to know about the Channel Islands, go to Isla, I-S-L-A, it means island. Islapedia, actually as of today, is 11,952 pages of island information, more than anybody could ever want to know. The second thing, I'd like to give a special shout out to Ethan McKinley, hidden in the back corner. He is our new superintendent of this park. Thank you, Ethan, for being here. And last but not least, I'd like everybody to know that we, the Santa Cruz Island Foundation, are going to be constructing a Channel Islands Research Center right here in Ventura, next to the Museum of Ventura County. We are in a $5 million capital campaign. We have just reached our $3 million point. If any of you is interested in knowing more about it, becoming a fellow at $20,000, uh, or a donor at any level, please feel free to contact me. So the first thing I do when I give any talk is I like to know about my audience. Raise your hand if you've been to Anacapa Island, please. Whoa, everybody's been to Anacapa Island. Keep your hand up if you've been to two islands, three islands, four islands, five islands, six islands, seven islands. Anybody here been to all eight islands who is not a member of the all eight club, see me afterwards. We have 211 members of the all eight club, people who have set foot on all eight California Channel Islands, 192 are still living. So with that, if we can dim the lights, we'll start the show. I'm delighted to talk about Anacapa Island. It's more than just a rock offshore. Um, is it possible to dim that? Maybe not. Um, Anacapa Island is in this county. It's in Ventura County. So is San Nicolas Island. And since many of you have been there, you know that Anacapa is off of Ventura. It's about 12 miles offshore. The earliest view we have of this island was actually an engraving done by James McNeil Whistler, who in 1871 painted his celebrated mother. In this case, 
Whistler did this engraving for the Coast Survey of Anacapa Island, and he took the artistic liberty of putting seagulls in the view for which he was uh, criticized. He quit his job, and the Coast Survey went on to reissue this two years later without Whistler's gulls. So you might want to know what people do on Anacapa Island. If you've never been there, it's just sort of this small, nondescript rock to the east of the largest of our California Channel Islands. Well, miners, Chinese abalone fishermen, crawfishermen, sealers, sheep ranchers, campers, pleasure seekers, naturalists, and collectors were among the people using the island in the 19th century. And we have a series of photographs taken by Santa Barbara photographer I.M. Cook that show us what Middle Anacapa and other parts of Anacapa look like. Here you can see a small boat and a camp set up on Anacapa. This is on Middle Anacapa facing east, Middle Anacapa Island facing west. And you can see two buildings right there. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Sealers. After sea otter hunters, sealers went out to kill seals. They tried the oil in camps on the island, collected the blubber, and I like this shot. I think it's very funny. Those seals are all dead, and they've propped them up. And if you look carefully, you can see a stick right there holding that seal's head up. So they were salting the photograph back then. The first long-term rancher on Anacapa Island, who was a squatter, his name was Ezekiel Elliott, and he and his son Joseph ranched on Anacapa Island for 16 years. This is on Middle Anacapa Island. These are the buildings that they occupied. The upper one was their bunkhouse. This one was a kitchen and dining room. They have some corrals down here. And the Elliots loved to entertain campers and people who wanted to come and visit Anacapa Island. So in the days before television, internet, etc., people often got together in groups and went on exploring trips and adventures. This is what there was to do. This is uh, a particular favorite of mine because this expedition went to Middle Anacapa Island in 1889 with three Santa Barbara luminaries. Lorenzo Yates, right here, you'll see in a moment, the great naturalist. Henry Chapman Ford, the artist, right here and I. N. Cook, the photographer, who took all of the photographs that we're looking at uh, in this 1889 series. This photograph, if you look carefully down on the rocks, you can see Henry Chapman Ford with his sketch pad drawing. And here's one of the results of his artwork. Morning at the Anacapas by Henry Chapman Ford. It was actually published in a book. The Elliots also welcomed campers and pleasure seekers. Look at the ladies in their Victorian wear, their long, their garb, their hats, their long skirts. This, this particular structure you'll see in a number of the photographs is a skiff hoist that was used to bring the, the boat up out of the water. The Gidney Party camped on Anacapa Island in 1890. Here you can see Mrs. Gidney right here with her, uh, she had a two-year-old son with her named Ray. Here's a camp at Frenchie's Cove on West Anacapa Island. You can see a tent and a shack with a peaked roof. Later that shack with the peaked roof was replaced by a couple of other uh, shacks with shed roofs, but this is all in the 19th century. You'll notice that this camp had a flag that said Anacapa. So as we leave Elliott's Harbor, looking back across the harbor at the view of Elliott's Ranch, a hundred years later, take note right here of these eucalyptus trees. Here's the same view a hundred years later. The camps are gone. There are the eucalyptus trees. This photograph fascinates me because the man standing on the natural bridge 
is standing on West Anacapa Island. Well, there's no such natural bridge, but by looking at photographs, I realized that that natural bridge spanned the gap right here between the shacks that were once at Frenchies. And after the natural bridge collapsed, a footbridge was put across the gap so they could still access across to the other shack. Yates Cave, named for Lorenzo Yates, the naturalist I pointed out to you, is the second deepest cave on Anacapa Island. And probably my all-time favorite photograph of Anacapa Island is this one. Look at the numbers of people, men and women, who gathered together to cross the channel on an adventure, presumably camping. They had long boats with them, and they went cave exploring. And here they are inside Yates Cave, later to be known as Frenchie's Cave, and it's where Ira Eaton is alleged to have hidden bootleg liquor, bootleg liquor during Prohibition. There's Lorenzo Yates. He was interested in, particularly interested in ferns, uh, plants. He was a botanist. He was a malacologist. He was a man of many hats. His ashes and his glasses are in the collections in the back room at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. There were bald eagles nesting uh, quite regularly at Anacapa Island. This specimen happens to be in the bowels of the Museum of Ventura County. It was shot by a Santa Paula grocer named Isaac Proctor Newton in 1892. It's the only specimen of a bird, a bald eagle, from Anacapa known. There are a number of eggs that were collected. So with all of this activity, the pleasure seekers, the hunters, oh, by the way, there were three gold rushes on Anacapa Island in the 1850s, the 1870s, and the 1890s. It was reported gold was out there, and there were many rushes, miners going over, chiseling away at the rock, looking for both gold and silver. Well, by 1902, Uncle Sam realized that their island was getting quite a bit of use, and they realized that Elliots had been ranching out there for all of these years. People were making a profit on the island. So they instituted a series of leases. So six leases were issued over 35 years. And the leases went to four different people. Two people had two leases. The first lessee was George Le Messonnier. And George bought out Ezekiel Elliott's sheep ranching interests. He paid for the sheep, he paid for the buildings, and he gave Ezekiel Elliott $8,000. He and his son started working Anacapa Island for economic profit. And it was in 1902 that the government said, hmm, we better do a lease. And so he got the first lease. It was for five years, and he paid $5 a year. In 1907, the lease went out to bid again. Each lease was in five-year increments. And so a local Venturan named Bay Webster, Heyman Bayfield Webster, won the lease. He and his wife Martha lived on Anacapa Island, both middle and west, with their family. They actually had children that lived out there with them, and they imported a school teacher to teach their children. And Bay Webster's great-grandson, lives in Ojai. So he's been at the source of many photographs and a great inspiration for learning about that family. Well, Bay Webster was very clever. When he developed West Anacapa Island, he built a number of shacks, and he named them Capacity, Felicity, Simplicity, Intensity, and Necessity. You can see the shacks along here. Here he is with his family at uh, West Anacapa Island, is what is now called Frenchie's Cove. Originally, Frenchie's Cove was called Webster Bay, named after Bay Webster. And he was uh, the Ventura postmaster. He drove a bus for a while. And they were a long-term Ventura family. Here's his son, Harvey. He's about eight or nine years old out at Frenchie's Cove. 
Here's Bay Webster at the hoist on Middle Anacapa Island. Remember, you saw the parts of that structure in an earlier view. This is a sheep chute. One might wonder how, this is like the she shed, uh, how does one move sheep? Well, you use a sheep chute. So the sheep were tied and slid down the chute on their backs, here's the sheep, to the waiting boat where they were loaded. Most of the sheep activity took place on middle Anacapa Island. You'll see an image shortly. Bay Webster also carried tourists and supplies on his little gasoline launch, named, of course, the Anacapa. So after 10 years of occupation of Anacapa Island, the lease went up to bid, and Ira Eaton, this is the only known photo of Ira. Here he is right here. Most of you know, many of you know, that he ran a resort at Pelican Bay on neighboring Santa Cruz Island. He was quite a character. He was a rum runner during Prohibition, and it's thought that he wanted the Anacapa Island lease for his illicit liquor business. So he paid several hundred dollars for the lease, far more than anyone else was willing to pay, and he outbid the others. Interestingly, he didn't ask anybody to leave Anacapa. He wasn't a full-time resident, but he certainly used the island in its caves. After Ira Eaton's 1927 lease expired, the government didn't issue a lease for the five-year period between 1928 and 1932. During those years, they had geared up to build a lighthouse on East Anacapa Island, and they didn't want people leasing the island during that activity. So the, the last lease that was issued went to Clarence Chafee, who was willing to pay $760 a year for five years. But he didn't get East Anacapa Island, he got the rest of the island. And Chafee, another well-known Ventura family, wanted to start a game reserve. He wanted to put birds out there, things like chucker and partridge, and have a hunting club. He wanted to have a fishing resort, but none of his plans came to fruition. He did have several partners, and they just faded away at the end of the lease. Now, I'm delighted to have met Bruce here this evening, whose mother was well acquainted with Frenchie, the most famous of Anacapa Island's residents. Frenchie was born in 1875. He lived on West Anacapa Island. He subsumed the buildings that Webster had built on the island. And he lived on the island first from 1928 until 1934, when he moved off the island and went over to Santa Cruz Island. So hold that thought, because when Frenchie lived like water flowing, someone came and filled in the gap of Frenchie's absence. Frenchie returned to Anacapa in 1938, where he lived until 1954. He was ultimately asked to leave the island because of his advanced age. He died in Santa Barbara. He had a house on Anacapa Street, and he died in Santa Barbara at age 87. Old Swede is the one who came in when he had heard Frenchie moved off of West Anacapa. So Old Swede, as he would be called, or Charlie, he moved in, and one of my favorite quotes from Anacapa Island is Merrill Carr Allen, who was one of Chafee's business partners. He knew Swede, and he said he never failed to take a bath on his birthday, October 12, Columbus Day, Christmas, and certain other occasions. After his last trip to town, Charlie climbed the path to his home, went in, closed the door, lay down on his bed, and died, just like he said he wanted to. He was found dead in his cabin on October 1st, 1938. And word spread among the fishermen living in the camps on the islands, and look who came back. Frenchie! Here he is. This is in the Park Service files, and it's labeled Frenchie's Catch of the Day. The Frenchie, among other fishermen living on the island, would often trade fish or lobsters for, guess what, wine. Many of the single fishermen that lived on the islands were alcoholics. They were sober, 
when no passing vessel had anything to trade, um, but they at every given opportunity would try and trade their fish or lobster for liquor. And when Pierre Greeny was a judge in Santa Barbara back in the 1930s and 40s, he often sentenced chronic alcoholic offenders for disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct to work out on his island, Santa Cruz Island, as hard laborers where they didn't have access to alcohol. It was the dry out program. So in the late 1940s or early 1950s, oh, this says circa 1940, Bay Webster on the right returned to Anacapa Island, and this is a very rare, lovely photograph of the two men sharing their memories, Frenchie now living in Bay Webster's cabin. A view looking down on the cabins, and this is where that footbridge crosses the gap right here. So in 1912, the Lighthouse Bureau put the first Anacapa light on East Anacapa Island. It was put up with uh, acetylene, it was an acetylene lamp, and the uh, sequoia that you see there in the, in the distance had to service the light every six months. Well, that went on for 20 years. This is amazing. The Lighthouse Bureau turned into the Coast Guard and it was decided to build a small, I call it the Anacapa Village, the Coast Guard facility on top of East Anacapa Island. Look at the links the workers had to get to use the top of the island to climb here, 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 here. There's ropes going down. There's a chute that comes down here for discharging rocks. And that's the beginning of the construction of the landing at East Anacapa Island that those of you who have been to East Anacapa, you've gone up those 158 stairs. That's the cliff face. So they started at the bottom. Here you can see some men leveling out a platform, some ropes. And they worked their way up the cliff face to the top. They put some stairs in down at the first level. And then that made it easier for the boat to bring supplies. Men hung from platforms to chip off rock to make the ascent easier for their construction. And actually in 1948, someone did fall. One of the workers did fall who was doing maintenance and was killed. By the way, in doing this research, today I was a reporter asked me a question, what are some of the most amazing things that you learned about Anacapa in researching this book? And one of the most amazing things I learned is that 57 people have died on Anacapa Island from various sources. Most of them drowned from shipwrecks, but uh, several drowned in accidents, such as the man that fell off the, the cargo net when he was doing some work. Here they are going up to the top landing right here, and then they built a road starting here that goes around and across the island. Here's that top landing. And they lived in tents. And the first contractors defaulted. The bid was put out a second time, and the second contractors came in to finish the job. I don't know how they got that piece of equipment to the top, but this young man's first job was to establish the roads on East Anacapa Island to bulldoze, well, that's not a bulldozer, it's a track grader, but to remove all the vegetation and to make pathways so that they would have access for building the various houses. So here you can see the first road and the finished road in 1931. They used a single sack cement mixer, if you can imagine such a thing. Water had to be hauled. And at this point, they were building a 30,000 square foot cement slab to serve as a water catchment. Since Anac East Anacapa Island is dry and there was no fresh water, they were hopeful that they would be able to catch enough 
fresh water to have it go through a system of pipes into two 55,000 gallon redwood storage tanks. And to protect the redwood storage tanks, a water tank house was built around them. When it was finished, it was stuccoed. And there's a legend that it was made to look like a church so vandals wouldn't shoot it. Unsubstantiated, but a nice story. The first assistant keeper's house under construction in 1931. And that house remains today. That's the house that you see when you go across East Anacapa Island uh, to your, on your east or left-hand side of the pathway. You can see the lighthouse in the distance. When the Coast Guard was finished with their construction, they had quite a little village that they had constructed. Beautiful uh, Spanish colonial architecture, very sturdy construction, full cut lumber, red tile roofs. So by the time they finished, they had a lower landing, an upper landing, four residences, a tank house, an oil house, a general services building, the water tank building, which is the building here, and of course that 30,000 gallon cement slab. And you can see how the water would have been collected here and it was run into pipes that came down to here. After the houses were constructed and the Coast Guard occupied the island, they had to haul their vessel out of the water. See it right here? On a little landing because there was no safe anchorage. So they actually hoisted their vessel out of the water and then relaunched it when they wanted to leave the island. It's a lot of work. So if you look at these stairs today, you see this set of stairs here in 2012, the Park Service decided that the stairs had reached their natural lifetime. It was time to put new stairs in. So this incredible Sikorsky helicopter slung the prefabricated stairs out to East Anacapa Island. And in quite an engineering feat, they were installed against the cliff. So today, Island Packers backs up to the ladder. You get on a landing. You go up the original stairs. Then you get to those and spile around and go on up to the top. A lighthouse. Remember there was that little acetylene light that was there for 20 years, but really there had been significant shipwrecks at Anacapa Island, 20 that I've counted, starting with the wreck of the Winfield Scott in 1853. The government decided that the island really needed a lighthouse. So construction began in 1931, at the same time the houses were being built. So you can see the lighthouse going up. And the finished lighthouse. Is Dan Harding here? These images are extraordinary, and they're with compliments, I thank you very much, of Dan Harding, who has been photo photographing Anacapa Island for close to half a century. And he provided many of the images in the book. That's an incredible image, and look at the falling star. This is also Dan's image going up inside the lighthouse to what is there today, a plastic light. The original beautiful prism, uh, crystal prism system, the Fresnel lens, was replaced with this automated light, but the original Fresnel lens is on display, as most of you know, on East Anacapa Island. In, one of, in the maintenance building at East Anacapa. So in 1938, President Roosevelt decided to make two of our offshore islands, the two smallest, into a national monument, Santa Barbara Island and Anacapa Island. And so they erected a sign and announced that this was Channel Island's national monument. There was no staff, there was no Falderall, there was no office, it was just a national monument. And so people continued, French, those are Frenchie's um, lobster traps that you see here. Frenchie was still on the island, that's the year he came back, when it was made into a monument. There you can see that sign a little bit better. Channel Islands National Monument. 
And the first building that the Park Service actively constructed was a, this Quonset Hut tent. And in the 60s, it was decided that a seasonal ranger could be put on Anacapa Island at Frenchie's Cove during the summer months. In 1968, Bill Connolly, I'm so blessed to be able to say my father-in-law, began Island Packers 50 years ago this year with his wife and family. And he decided that he wanted his kids to grow up in an outdoor environment to learn about nature and become men of the sea. My husband ended up going to the California Maritime Academy thanks to a scholarship from Bob Lagomarsino, who was impressed with the Island Packer business. And this is one of their first brochures advertising picnicking, camping, sightseeing, cruises, all for a dollar and a half. There's the Connolly family launching the Island Packer in 1968 with Margaret the Basset Hound. Their first vessel was the Island Packer. They used it for a year until it sank at East Anacapa Island. They had been out on a trip. The vessel had engine trouble. The Coast Guard was called took it under tow, towed it too fast, the boat swamped and sank. So the Connolly family reassessed and ended up buying the Paisano in 1969. And the Paisano ended up in, when she retired, she eventually didn't pass Coast Guard uh, specifications and she was retired to a bean field here in Oxnard. The Wee Seven, there's the iconic arch rock was used by Island Packers for about a decade. And the kids for these trips in those days landed all of the passengers at Frenchie's Cove in a skiff with an outboard, dragging the skiff. I see a couple people shaking heads. Some of you experienced the early Island Packer skiff landing trips. They were amazing. That's for those of you who know Mark Connolly, that's Mark right there and Kirk built the skiffs. And along came the most wonderful man, Bill Ehorn. He was assigned to Channel Islands National Monument. People immediately took to Bill Ehorn, to his ideas, to his warmth, to his friendliness, and he transitioned Channel Islands National Monument to Channel Islands National Park. And when he did so, this, these photographs are from Bill. This is the entire staff of Channel Islands National Park the year after it became a park in 1981. Today, the staff numbers about 10 times that many. At East Anacapa Island, Island Packers continued to uh, offload passengers going up the ladder from their skiff. And they purchased the Sunfish, which served their business for 20 years. And I'm sure many of you know the Sunfish and have ridden it multiple times. The Vanguard today is a leased vessel, and it's used simply to go to Anacapa Island out of Channel Islands Harbor. And a Connolly uh, family member is the captain, my nephew. And in 2000, Island Packers upgraded to the series of three wonderful fast catamarans they have today. The catamarans are able to back up to the ladder at Anacapa Island to offload. This is obviously a trip going to San Miguel Island where they still have to use skiffs at Kyler's Harbor. Now, how many photographers can get a photograph of the vessel, the whale tail, and the iconic east end of Anacapa? That's pretty amazing, but there's more. Thank you, Dan Harding. This actually is obviously the iconic arch. These are all Dan Harding's photos. They are in color, but since the book was in black and white, we had to publish them in black and white. So coming in to East Anacapa Island, there's the Island Packer boat, the cliffs, and the landing is right around the corner to the right, as you all know. 
There's the landing and what is left of the buildings that were built by the Coast Guard in the 30s. And another Dan Harding view of the East End, it's an aerial. The Coast Guard began dismantling the buildings. The Park Service said, wait, stop. Please don't tear them down. They stopped and these are the buildings that remain and they're quite used today. Here's Cathedral Cove that one sees on the loop around the island. Another Dan Hardy. What a magnificent shot showing the juxtaposition of the freighter, the, the foghorn, and the lighthouse. There are two plants endemic to Anacapa Island. I put this one in because it's named after my friend Steve Junak. It's Malacothrix junakii. It's known from two specimens. Things that live on Anacapa Island, non-human. Sheep were eradicated in about 1937. As I mentioned, most of them were on Middle Anacapa. This is the top of Middle Anacapa Island. And those sheep would have been either shot or sent down the chute onto a vessel. There were European rabbits, presumably introduced by Coast Guard personnel. They were eradicated in the mid-1960s, so today they're only known from uh, biological specimens. Rats were eliminated in 2004 by aerial drops of poison. Anacapa deer mice are on all three islets. As you know, if you leave anything on the ground, they will find their way into them. They'll chew through tents, backpacks, etc. There's a slender salamander that's about three inches long. It's the cutest thing you've ever seen. You don't see them very often, but they sort of look like worms with legs. And there are two species of lizards. There's the western side blotch lizard, and down below the mean-faced alligator lizard. That's it for what lives on Anacapa, other than those things that fly. There are nine species of seabirds. They're listed here. If you look closely, you see the chicks right here of the western gulls, and it's always at your own risk when you go to Anacapa Island during the nesting season of western gulls. That's Dan Harding's wife being bombed by a seagull. And a beautiful view of the western gulls out at Inspiration Point. Three of the seabird species nest in crevices on the cliffs, pigeon guillemots, ashy storm petrels, and scripps murlets. They're all extremely rare seabirds that need Anacapa Island as a nesting habitat. I just love this photograph. Um, the photographer here, Steve Munch in Ventura, gave me that photograph. There are California sea lions that haul out at Anacapa. And there are harbor seals that breed and live in the splash zone. All right, now this next series of photographs. I was talking about how a photographer could get a photograph of something with the arch in the background. Check this out. Here you have common dolphins, the arch in the background. Here you have an orca breaching, the arch in the background. And you have a blue whale sounding, arch in the background. Pretty phenomenal. That's the aerial of the blue whale. And I'm delighted to see that my very favorite all-time underwater photograph is here on the wall. It was taken by my friend and fellow Explorer Club member, Jeff Bosniak. And it just, it's, it elicits a visceral reaction to these gentle giants whose nurseries and breeding grounds are right off of East Anacapa Island. These uh, bl giant black sea bass can grow up to 800 pounds. And last but not least, one of the most amazing uses of Anacapa Island to me are the marathon open ocean swimmers who see this as a challenge. And to date, more than 75 swimmers have gone out to Anacapa Island by their own power by swimming either to the island or from the island, and in 1978, the very first person 
who accomplished this feat is a woman named Penny Palfrey, who got in the water at Oxnard, swam to East Anacapa Island, touched the island, pushed off, and swam back. And when you look at the distance, you really gain a respect for someone who could swim that distance. Behind this is Santa Barbara Island, the smallest of the Channel Islands. So that concludes the show. Be sure and talk to me if you've been to all eight islands. And here's a shout out to all of the many photographers whose work I was able to use. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Did you want me to do that from up here, Bonnie, or? Yes, for the Q&A portion, I can uh, bring the microphone to you. There's a question in the back. How did the early farmers and ranchers get enough water to feed them for themselves and for their animals to survive? Well, it said that the sheep lived off of the fog drip from the plants. Presumably, they had to haul their own water. I haven't found any records of it. But the animals, the sheep, were left for long periods of time, and they survived with fog drip off of uh, ice plants and other, other vegetation. There is one freshwater spring in a cave on West Anacapa Island, which is where Frenchy got water. It's called Indian Water Cave. Uh, but it doesn't have a very high production rate. Yes? How can one get to San Nicolas Island? Oh, you can trespass. You can, I'm not advocating that. Um, you can sign up with Channel Islands Restoration and hope that they have a project or a program going on San Nicolas Island. Those are really the two best ways the other way is to become a donor to the Santa Barbara Navy League, who has adopted Santa Bar San Nicolas Island as their special station. And with contributions to them, occasionally they have trips available. Those are the three ways I know. What was the distance that the woman swam? 12.2 12. 12. 12. miles each way. So about 25 miles. One of the early photos you had there, one of the men was, remember the photo with the four men that you had labeled? One of them was, looked like holding a rifle. Can you comment on that? The only thing I can say is they were probably shooting bird specimens or perhaps sheep. That was very common. I mean, like Isaac Proctor shot the bald eagle. It was common in those days for men to carry rifles with them. Doesn't it make you want to go back to Anacapa Island and look at it with new eyes now? Yes. I have a very different type of question. Uh, way back when uh, all of this land was uh, owned by Mexico, uh, it was under uh, my impression, I had been told, that when they drew up the, the grant for the purchase, it did not include the Channel Islands. Can you expound on that for us? Yes, that's true. And there have been two waves of movements by Mexico to try and claim that the islands were not included uh, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. And as late as the 1960s, there was another wave of interest from Mexico trying to claim them. But the issue was finally settled by Congress and the two governments so that uh, all of the acquisition of Alta California, what it was certified that it did include the islands. So the issue won't come up again. What, what about Chumash remains on Anacapa? Are there some? The prehistory of Anacapa is very sparse because Anacapa Island was used primarily as a uh, transient stopping station. There were never any uh, 
Native American prehistoric villages or uh, major occupation areas that have been found on the Anacapas. No, but his collections are in the Museum of Ventura County. And Dave Mills' uh, father, Don Mills, is a very good friend. And he was a very good friend of Merrill Allen. So I've had access to Merrill's collection through Don Mills. And that's where the photos of, for example, uh, Charlie Johnson came from. Those were in Merrill's collection. He was one of the partners of Chafee for the last lease up to, that ended in 1937. He was one of the people interested in some sort of economic development of Anna Kappa. And so that's how he uh, befriended both Frenchie and Charles Johnson. And he's written a wonderful manuscript called Three Kings of Anna Kappa. And I have it posted on Eastlopedia. If you look up Merrill Allen, you'll see a link to the manuscript and you can read his writings. Eastlopedia has over links to over a thousand people whose lives intersected with the California Channel Islands. And um, unpublished manuscripts are often linked to their page. We're trying to make everything accessible to the public. Yes, I was out on Anacap Island with a local Naval Reserve unit in 1972. We were working in the area of the lighthouse, and I thought I had seen the whole thing. I don't remember any buildings there at all. And I'm just wondering how we could have missed them. I think you went right to the lighthouse. <laughs> we, well, no, we went there and I walked all the way to the other end of the island. The buildings were there. Yeah, well, it's a puzzle to me, so. Yes, up front here. There, what it showed the breeding season for the, uh, the Western Gull. But when I've been out there recently during that time, there's a lot more quarry offices. That whole area now is covered with coreopsis and vesicles in the dry years. Is there, is it the gulls are pretty hard. During nesting season, the gulls are pretty hard on the vegetation. They basically pound down and hammer any vegetation that's over knee high. I mean, all the bushes, they fight for space. Um, they're pretty ruthless to the vegetation. Well, so, the bear in your photo, that's why I was asking, but there's a lot of stuff there now. Is it because maybe they eradicate? Well, there is a restoration program going on where, yeah, where, where plants are being grown and reintroduced to the area. Marla, when I lead hikes on the island, I go past that big concrete pad. And I think, what a poor design. I mean, the seagulls have decorated that. I can't imagine any the of the water being even passable but I guess could be filtered, I don't know. Well, it reminds me of a story, Buster Hyder, who, who grew up on Santa Barbara Island, the smallest island. When he was a, a teenager, one of his jobs, they had a rain catchment system off of the, their little house on Santa Barbara Island, and one of his jobs as a teenager was with the first rain to go up on the tar paper roof, scrub off the, the guano so that there wouldn't be so much of it in their water. Similar. Anything else? Did they ever get any water with that catchment system? Presumably, I don't know, I don't have any records, but inside the building there are records and numbers on the wall that look like somebody was tracking the amounts of water. But the tanks are beautiful. We have the name of the man who, who was in, he, he came down, I think, from San Francisco to build the tanks. He was a master craftsman, and the tanks are just magnificent. They're beautiful. They're beautifully joined, and they're still protected by the building today. Well, thank you all um, for coming.